the list, by the way, at the back as CH. Don't know what this means. But the, <laughs> the pronunciation list has the correct one for some reason. And Kishkumen has a C. Remember the city of Kumani, or however it's pronounced? It's got a C. It's sort of interesting. Well, then there's also spellings that deal with homophones. You have to figure out what word was intended. Is the word right, R-I-T-E, the rights of their religion? The current text has an R-I-T-E-S. Is that correct? Straight, one that's caused considerable debate. Is it the one with the G-H, the one without? Is it being narrow or not crooked? And travel versus travail. Oliver Cowdery apparently pronounced them travel, both. This is the common pronunciation for both words. And we have to figure out which ones are travel, the travels of the Jews, or the travails of the Jews. And you can't tell by the spellings of by the scribes. Okay, grammatical usage. The Book of Mormon has been edited basically from dialectal English into standard English, from Geneva Road English into BYU English. Yeah. Some of this editing is accidental. It occurred accidentally in trans going between the manuscripts and into the 1830 edition. It wasn't intended. But beginning with the 1837 edition, this was consciously done, attempting to remove dialectal things that would be considered non-standard, such as they was, that they were, them days, to those days. The most significant kind of grammatical change, though, in the Book of Mormon text has been to remove King James Version language. The most prominent one is changing which to who. Our Father, which art in heaven, was the original reading for the Lord's Prayer in 3 Nephi, edited to Our Father, who art in heaven, which is what we would expect, at least with respect to that relative pronoun. Because that changed to because, because that he came, this is not uh, standard English, but it's in the King James Bible. And he saith, uh, in lots of narratives in the Bible, especially in the, in the New Testament, it's in the present. This gives an immediacy to it. And these have been edited basically to said. And uh, so when uh, Amulek and Zedrim are going at each other, the original text says, and he saith, he saith, he saith, and these have been edited to he said. There are examples of phraseology. And these are more accidental, and I gave some examples of the repeated uh. Note that the examples that we've, these examples, virtually all of these that I've been talking about, some of them, the grammatical at least, thus far would not show up in a translation, for the most part. Most of these grammatical things, whether you use which or who, if you're translating another language, that language will tell you which relative pronoun to use. So these things really aren't that significant from a meaning point of view. But there are meaning ones. And we saw some examples, like the sword of the justice of God being accidentally changed to the word. And these clearly would show up and translate. And these are about the highest level we're going to get, though, in terms of meaning changes. Um, Finally, we have a group of items that we could call clarifications. Joseph Smith, in his edit, for the first 100 pages, every time he did it, 1837, 1840, we also know he was doing it a third time in about 1842, he works very assiduously and pretty carefully for about the first 100 pages. And then, the demands on his time make it so that he apparently cannot continue doing the editing at that level of detail. 
And so he doesn't continue. He does a more rapid and getting only the essential changes that he wanted, the grammatical ones that would be clearly non-standard. For example, in these two, these are, these are 1837 changes uh, made by Joseph Smith in um, his own hand. And notice, they're really clarifications, perhaps. I mean, we can, you know, he pitched his tent in a valley beside a river of water. And he changed it to by the side of a river of water, even though beside does mean by the side of historically. Or in the account of the dream, methought I saw a dark and dreary wilderness, and Joseph added, in my dream. It's really not necessary, but it's a clarification just in case you didn't remember that he was describing the dream. Finally, we come to the five chestnuts. The ones that everyone seems to be exercised over. The point is, there first of all, aren't too many. And, and when you compare with other texts and people debating over what the text should read. The first one is one that was discussed yesterday. The example, Claire, the first one, the mother of God, changed in the 1830 edition to the mother of the son. I view these myself as in the clarification mode. These kinds of changes are found only in the first part of the text. There are later ones that Joseph Smith could have changed God to Son of God, but he did not. I also added in the extra one here of Jesus Christ being changed to the Messiah. These are, I think, clarifications. We can't be really absolutely sure what was in Joseph Smith's mind. A lot of people are speculating as to the theological reasons or the attempts to make the text more consistent or something. Joseph Smith made the changes. He didn't leave any notes or explanations. Maybe, for example, he didn't like the Catholic-sounding mother of God. <laughs> in any event, um, these, in my mind, are clarifications. The next one is one that's probably a scribal heir, the son of the only begotten of the Father. I suppose one could say if they really believe this, that somehow this must mean Jesus had offspring. Well, it, it's probably a scribal error. It occurs in the manuscript. We don't have the original manuscript. It is in the hand of the scribe two of the printer's manuscript. Apparently, the scribe, hearing a lot of ofs, put in too many. Put in an extra one. The son of the only begotten of the father, after the order of the son of the only begotten of the father. We have these extra ofs. Joseph Smith removed them in the second edition quite correctly. These probably are just simple scribal errors. The third one is this white and delightsome change to pure and delightsome. There has been more ink <laughs> on this one than any one. And it's all about motives. And it's really, I think, an embarrassment. Um, first of all, the textual evidence. This change appears in the 1840 edition. We presume that it was made by Joseph Smith. But we can't be sure. It just appears. It is probably not a typo, a misreading, because white and pure look so different. It probably was consciously done. Um, in preparing the 1981 edition, the committee at the church considered this reading in the 1840 edition, and they made the change based on the 1840 edition. It is, in my mind, quite clear that there was no political motivation 
They were not trying to remove racism from the Book of Mormon text. The reason this is very clear is there are eight other passages they did not touch. 